so yeah so hello friends uh, this is anshuman tiwari and we are at my channel and uh, podcast called manage better as you know i bring to you uh, topics and guests and you know speakers who can uh, relate to the theme of managing better and bring various dimensions of management and leadership to the table today i am delighted to bring you uh, ramesh durairaj ramesh durairaj coaches ceos sales and pre sales teams in his consulting practice he is currently a writer consultant and very interestingly chief problem finder at leaders anvil uh, we will get to know more about the problem finding part um, uh, he has uh, a vast experience in the mostly in the it services industry over 30 years uh, working with majors like tcs infosys wipro and mindry um, has anchored deals over 2.5 billion dollars um, led large software teams interestingly also was um, head of quality for one of these uh, companies that he um, uh, that i spoke about which um, which is interesting because it brings together the consumer and uh, quality part which i am very passionate about and we'll speak about it uh, during the session um, some years ago um, he used all this experience and um, that he had and brought it together into a book uh, which became a best seller uh, and which is one of the reasons why we are talking today the book is called games customers play and if you haven't read it or um, or, or uh, want to learn more about it please check it out on on, on amazon and um, i think it was read the or listed the most memorable business books of 2018 so um, a uh, very accomplished uh, speaker author and consultant in the space of you know how customers think what customers think in uh, in today and which is very critical in today's scenario so i bring to you ramesh durairaj ramesh uh, yours for some opening comments and then we get into some questions uh, anshun uh, thank you uh, uh, wonderful to be here uh, and you know having followed some of your uh, podcasts Uh, i can see the passion of uh, getting things done uh, taking priority over you know thinking about what to do uh, people tend to say analysis by paralysis uh, you can have uh, 25 brilliant strategies but uh, a guy with one decent strategy but who executes it well will beat a person with 25 brilliant strategies who you know keeps gazing at his navel and uh, just doesn't get to work yeah. so that uh, really uh, it it really is uh, uh, wonderful to see uh, a podcast that focuses on getting things done uh, rather than about thinking extremely deeply about things uh, and doing nothing after that so uh, and my book as well if you really look at it is uh, in a sense uh, uh, a sort of a a gentle kick i would say uh, to uh, to prod people into thinking about uh, things fast and then moving on to action um, and we will obviously look at it in more depth as we discuss it but that's why i'm really delighted to be here no thanks thanks a lot ramesh um, thanks for your time as well and i'm i'm hoping that you know this unique mix of um, quality and uh, you know consumer insight will be good for our listeners so i i thought i'll start with a uh, you know with a question which brings together you know these topics you know so your book uh, games customers play is all about customer relationships how they think what they do and you know why they do maybe uh, and on a daily basis um, what do you think customers are saying and more importantly not saying and how does one decipher it amongst all the noise you know because there is usually a lot of noise and from that noise you are trying to pick what the customer is actually saying or not saying yeah uh, in, in fact uh... Uh, the noise is so much uh, that now uh, an office going now of course office is at home but a city dwelling office going person is bombarded by about 100000 words every day mm. uh, and you know 
there is so much of competition for this attention and there's so much of distraction that uh, an average human being's attention span uh, is now at about 8.25 seconds. So that's the kind of uh, noise that is out there. But coming back, uh, you know, how do you decipher uh, the signal from the noise? Uh, let me start with an example. Imagine uh, you're getting into a local coffee shop, you know, uh, which is possible about seven months back. Uh, a, a small one selling probably some idli, dosa and coffee. Uh, you order a coffee, say 10 rupees. And out comes this waiter with a headdress, starched white uniform, gold buttons, you know, golden white cap. Uh, and he carries one large silver tray with a nice, beautiful china pot of coffee, some cream and some cookies. What's the first reaction? Guys, I'm not paying for this. I asked for a 10 rupee coffee. Uh, so, if there is a dissonance between what the customer wants and the customer is being serviced by you, uh, the, the signal itself uh, becomes very difficult to decipher if you only do what you do and not what the customer, uh, you're listening to the customer. Uh, so, there are quite a few signals that customers and prospects send. Uh, we tend to ignore them. Uh, because of our enthusiasm and, you know, the pressure to co collect customers, as I call it, uh, collect the logos that you can mm. put on your PowerPoint presentations and the pressure to sell more, uh, which mm. is a natural pressure. Every, every business wants to sell more. Uh, but in this case, I was walking into a bare bones uh, tea shop, uh, which is on the roadside. I, I do so because I expect ready-made tea in a stainless steel tumbler or probably a paper cup. So the first signal uh, to you when a, when a customer comes in uh, is why is that customer coming to you? Mm. I mean, if, if somebody, if somebody, you know, uh, I mean, you are a tea seller mm. at a roadside uh, or a peanut vendor and somebody in a Mercedes Benz S class comes and, you know, uh, opens the door for the person at, who gets off from the back and comes to you and says, I want uh, a cup of tea. Uh, the, the scene itself is very incongruous. Yeah. Right. The first signal therefore is the size of the customer. Larger customers tend to be more powerful. And they're likely to use their size to get a better than fair deal for themselves. Hmm. Uh, they'll promise volumes, they'll promise visibility, uh, whatever. Uh, but at the same time, they would ask for a better than fair deal. And that's usual because yeah. that's the way they're structured uh, as they grow and with multiple silos within that organization demanding the best. For example, the users will want the best. Uh, whereas the finance in that same company would want the cheapest. Cheapest. And the sourcing people will want the most favorable terms. Uh, these are signals that you can easily discern and anticipate. Uh, in fact, your attention should go up a notch only when these three traditional stakeholders are not playing those traditional roles and stray from that script. Only then... Uh, is it something unusual? Again, we know, you know, uh, that government is one of the largest customers. They send out different signals. Uh, they're similar to large companies, but they also want to make sure that how they buy is not only fair, but also seen to be fair. Right. And so they have multiple uh, restrictions on how they buy, how they deal with you, even during project executions. Uh, some companies, uh, you could check out reputations. Some don't pay promptly, some drag acceptance, some uh, uh, demand changes even after the uh, things are signed. Uh, some startups, unfortunately, in India have uh, gained uh, uh, a rather uh, unsavory reputation for not making payments. Uh, and uh, that makes people, especially freelancers like me, 
and other small companies which cannot afford a true end customer hesitate to service those startups as well. Sorry to say that, but that seems to be uh, something that's happening uh, not infrequently. So the key to understanding your customer messages uh, is to first understand, obviously, the customer size and, and behavior, past behavior in the market. And then also the nature of the relationship with your customer, especially with respect to the power balance that exists. Mm. Uh, and in the book, I talk about those four archetypes of buyer-seller relationships, uh, the transactional, the personal, seller tyranny and buyer tyranny. Uh, and these four, uh, once you can slot a customer into one of those quadrants, uh, you know what kind of signals you can pick up and uh, therefore how you sell into them, how you uh, service them and how you fix issues when things happen uh, will be different for each of these quadrants. No, very well said, Ramesh. I think uh, I particularly like the, uh, you know, particularly the, the, the part around the T seller part where you kind of visualize the whole uh, customer buyer uh, relationship. And, um, and coming from somebody who has been in, you know, multi-million dollar deals to see the spectrum that, okay, the understanding or the need to understand consumer behavior at a T seller on the roadside or in a multi-million dollar deal is the same. The need is same. The, uh, the yeah. concepts may be different, but the need is same. And uh, which, which also reminds me of, of the work that one of my favorite authors, Ram Charan, uh, does is that, you know, he kind of connects the fruit vendor on the roadside and says that they are the best businessmen. You know, they, uh, the way they manage business uh, on a daily basis is most amazing. Um, so, so I think that uh, this is a very good segue into how, uh, where I wanted to get next is that what is your favorite story? And I'm sure you've been in many a battle and would have uh, some scars to show as well. But um, what is your favorite story of uh, around, you know, consumer understanding and misunderstanding? Um, and you can pick one uh, or, or two maybe, uh, I, but yeah. yeah. So there are a few, so I'll try to give a few examples. You know, well, what I've found in the service business is that uh, uh, one of the frequent things is that it's the supplier who misunderstands the priorities of the customers. Uh, for instance, there was this uh, case of a CRM system that needed to be rolled out. Uh, it was getting delayed. Mm. Uh, and the message that went out to the customer was that, you know, you had asked for more features. And so you have to wait longer for the whole package to be installed. And, you know, sometimes when we, when we convey such decisions, we convey it almost as a fait accompli. You know, you don't have a choice. Uh, it is delayed and it is what it is. Uh, uh, and, but when we reviewed the project later on after, you know, it went live, uh, the customer actually said, you know, guys, I really wanted only a few features up front. Uh, you could have come to me and told me, look, we can't roll the whole thing, but uh, a few things uh, rolled out first and then later uh, we could have talked about how to roll out the rest of the features. Uh, you know, I was really puzzled as to why you guys made the assumptions about my priorities. Mm. So, so I think that's, that's one of the, uh, the first things we do is we tend to think it's either all or nothing. Um, you know, the customer is either extremely happy or extremely displaced. Uh, there's no middle in between. And then that's how in the, in the pressure of doing stuff and in the pressure of uh, uh, keeping the customer happy and all of that, we sometimes miss that there is a, a broad spectrum of uh, possible choices available to us, especially yeah. when faced with a crisis. And, and that's when misunderstandings become uh, more. Uh, the second one was a IT services co company that I know, and which is developing a payroll uh, program for a US company. 
mm-hmm. and everything was going fine and it was going to testing uh, acceptance testing and then the customer says hey there is no w2 form now w2 form for us uh, uh, the indian equivalent is the form 16 the tax deduction at source mm. uh, yeah thing that needs to be signed and given to the employee saying i've deducted so much of tax and given it to the government we i mean uh, that feature was completely missed and the customer was saying how can you miss this i mean this is like if it's payroll then w2 is standard is, part it's so, yeah is something you can't even not think. think about right it's about you know again a misunderstanding that led to uh, a little bit of a fiasco there uh, another powerful yeah. example uh, that is uh, more recent was when there was a bid for maintaining the entire uh, erp uh and rolling out a few more features uh for a electrical manufacturing major a worldwide leader so the focus on that meeting was about you know we thought it was about cost savings and so we went in with graphs which showed how much they can save how much uh, you know and all that uh, i think it was the fourth slide when the cio of the client organization stopped us and said guys you know are you sh- sure about this are you have you understood what i want clearly because you can't deliver it at this price you know mm. please do please go do rework uh, i'm i'm free tomorrow as well so we can have a, a discussion tomorrow in the evening uh, thankfully we went and we uh, you know we worked out uh, the, the thing is a complete misunderstanding of the customer thinking it's cost savings that was the was the most important thing whereas for the customer it was something else so no, yeah true. as the adage goes you know the that when in doubt ask you know and most of the time in consumer relationships or customer relationships especially in b2b uh, many of us actually don't even ask right so we assume um, yeah. i have been in several situations yeah. from uh some years back where there was a major quality certification going on and we had to finish and um, you know if i could delay one of the assessments by a quarter i could have saved a lot of money because then i can bundle it with other assessments and uh, we we just assumed that the customer will not be okay with that and later on over a you know uh, casual meeting the customer say yeah fantastic it would have saved you money you know you would have made some profit in a this is a low margin deal anyway why didn't you ask and um, we were left scratching our heads as to <laughs> why did we not <laughs> even try <laughs> so so yeah i mean uh, you're right uh, of course this was not uh, you know a huge loss but you know still the the concept was the same that you know all we needed is just to ask and we were speaking to the customer on a regular daily almost you know weekly basis so there were plenty of opportunity to do that um so yeah so i i did mention quality so that probably brings me to the question that you know you you straddled uh, both uh, roles in some ways you know most of it is in sales and marketing but uh, quite a bit in quality so how do you see these um, the quality function and uh, the consumer or the you know sales marketing functions related to each other or interdependent if i may say yeah uh yeah you know to me customer focus or consumer focus as you, as you call it uh, is about the kind of experience we give to a customer during three stages of the engagement uh, the three stages are uh, buying using and fixing if you look at it from the uh, customer's view point Uh, how can we make as as sellers and suppliers of goods and services how can we make the buying process easy for the customer for example amazon has got this one click buy uh, and then how can we make the, help the customer use the products and services for that purpose and maybe even beyond uh, and the third area of focus is how do we fix things when something goes wrong 
uh, I, I think about uh, rather very unscientific uh, data uh, gathering that I've done, but I think about 80% of customer issues that we see or poor experience is about not fixing stuff uh, promptly and in a manner that the customer can verify that that thing is fixed and doesn't create a problem again. So these are the three areas where customer focus becomes uh, important and customer focus is uh, visible to the customer that I am focused to the customer. Otherwise, all that uh, he hears is that, uh, yeah, we are a very customer focused organization. Uh, other than that, he doesn't hear anything. It's, it's only when we give it an experience uh, that they uh, feel our focus. Now, having said that, let's look at quality. Uh, quality for a very long time was measured, even though not defined, as the lack of having any defects uh, or as a deviation from spe specifications. But then, you know, as we all know, I think uh, the uh, definition of quality or how quality is perceived has uh, has become a very much larger uh, concept. Uh, first is obviously it uses uh, it meets uh, users' expectation on outcome. Uh, second yeah. is that the outcome is achieved without the customer having to spend unexpected, unanticipated effort or resources. Uh, and third is this intangible, even indescribable way in which something that we supply or uh, you know, we, we service uh, makes the customer feel better. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that, that's, how I have, uh, that's how I've kind of uh, seen quality. Uh, uh, ultimately, as I think Maya Angelou said, uh, you know, people don't remember what you said to them or what you did to them. They remember how you how made them feel. Made them feel. Uh, and I think uh, that is a mantra that uh, I think uh, people in service delivery uh, have to learn and have to internalize. Uh, and, you know, and by the way, it's been a journey for me as well, uh, from just merely meeting expectations to... Uh, making a customer feel uh, better. Uh, and I think this third aspect is where customer focus really makes sense. If customer focus can be uh, on areas where you make the customer feel better, I think the rest will actually follow. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's how both of them are related uh, as far as I'm concerned. No, I, Does I that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And then it, it prompts a thought as well that I sometimes, you know, uh, speak to teams that look, and this is very relatable to the theme that you talk about PM's customers play or what they are saying and not saying, you know, if, if we are struggling with basic delivery and then we go and start offering some bells and whistles and the, you know, other stuff, the customer is not listening. And he's probably uh, thinking that, you know, you guys can't deliver me, to me on time in, and what is agreed, and then you are offering me the world, I, I don't trust you even more now than last week. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it is, it's a very customized situation all the time, you know, uh, like most situations, the same approach doesn't fit and shouldn't fit, you know, so we must be able to understand, okay, what is our uh, relationship in this situation based on that uh, service delivery quality and all these things. Uh, matter. If it is fantastic, then I, I think um, sales service delivery or, or uh, you know, quality can be the best salesman. You know, you don't need a, a further marketing at all because you have already proved it. Um, so I, I think as we as we come to the end of this conversation closer, yeah. I, I just wanted to just sure, sure. Uh, you know thought you know you know you uh, there's no point in servicing uh, an overcooked, burnt cutlet in a silver platter. Yeah. You know, the customer is not going to be happy just because you serve a silver platter. 
Yeah, no, no, fair enough. He came there to eat the eat the cutlet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very well said. Very well said. I think uh, at the end of the day, content mat- matters, and packaging can only take it this this far and no more. So um, uh, the that actually you know brings me towards you know I'm I'm trying to as we try to wrap up this conversation, Ramesh. Um, though I don't want to, but I think keeping the format mm-hmm. in mind. um but um, you know a, a little bit more about your book um, and uh, you know what made you write it and is there another one in pipeline or something um something about that yeah so you know human to human interactions uh, is shaped by many forces uh, and they result in a power equilibrium uh, where one holds the upper hand um, and sometimes the power imbalance uh, moves from one person to the other and buyers and sellers too are shaped by many forces uh, that influence uh, where the balance of power lies uh, i was reading this book uh, by daniel goleman uh, called social intelligence and he talks about how individuals treat another individual as a you or an it Mm. in other words how a person treats another person as a person or as a transaction or even as an object uh so that got me thinking you know do buyers treat sellers as individuals or objects and why do they do it when when do they do it and similarly a seller can also treat uh a buyer as a person or as a transaction so when you put these two behaviors you get a two by two matrix which is very popular with all of us yeah and you get this four quadrants so when both treat each other as mere transactions then we can say that that relationship is in the transactional quadrant uh, uh before we dismiss this quadrant as very impersonal that is where most of our transactions occur at least the base level transactions you know you buying a ticket uh, to a, in a in a bus you don't know the name of the conductor the conductor doesn't have to know your name your history to you know issue a ticket if that happens for all your uh, regular day to day transactions uh, if we had to do all of that it will become extremely exhausting and very inefficient mm. uh, you know uh, second you have the case where both parties have to know each other very well uh, an executive coach and a ceo for example uh, a specialist doctor a, a senior advisor on the board of a company without both parties knowing each other such a relationship would be a disaster i mean you won't go to a doctor who treats you like uh, you know as a disease uh, only for, for the disease uh you go to a doctor who treats you as a person and the same way when you go to a doctor you also find out his antecedents his his professional uh, capabilities typically referred or you know has been with your family for a long time so these are what we call as relationships in the personal quadrant mm. the third uh, and third is a is a case where as a supplier you need to do a lot about buyer 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 preferences uh, spend effort in understanding the organization while the buyer is actually not worried too much about what the seller is except for some basic qualification criteria and whether the seller has some references we call i call such rel- uh, such relationships in the buyer tyranny quadrant because in this quadrant the power balance is tipped in favor of the customer Mm. uh and and in most cases as i said earlier those organizations are structured in a way and people inside inside it are incentivized in a way that that power imbalance is not only uh, exhibited but also in some cases required and mandated by the organization uh for example you know of uh, uh you also being in the it services you would have heard of cases where uh, the sourcing team says no you, for 6 months you cannot for during the bid process 
you cannot meet any buyer mm. uh, you can't uh, do that so what they are trying to do uh, is to reduce your services to a commodity which can be you know kind of uh, evaluated as an apples versus apples case whereas actually your services are not but uh, then the customer has so much power that they mandate that your services are that way and that's the way you need to interact mm. so that's the kind of power imbalance and th- that gets exhibited and uh, yes uh, the word tyranny may be a, uh, a, a strong word but uh, in some cases it is tyranny uh, i can recall quite a few examples I, um and because of lack of time i don't want to go through them uh, in detail but i know of cases where you know uh, they uh, customers have contracted for a f- uh, five year contract promising that you know for five years we want uh, to serve you and therefore please give us uh, your best price and within one year come back and say no no you have to rebid the whole thing and you have to waive uh, termination without cost clause Uh, that we had uh, in the earlier contract you have to waive it so that you participate uh, again in the rebid within one year of that contract getting uh, executed um, and because it's a large contract uh, no ceo over the salt will say no i cannot uh, do it like this this bad they all go and bid and that's uh, to my mind that's uh, tyranny uh, because no i think it's no i think in some situations yeah you and i know that tyranny may be a polite word actually <laughs> so <laughs> so we we i've seen enough and you've seen more than enough to know that uh, it could be it could be polite in some cases uh, i mean even little things like you know you uh, as a freelancer you set up a meeting in uh, pune and you spend your time uh, flying there uh, only after you land at the airport to get a this thing saying sorry i'm going to be busy uh, can we do the meeting next week mm. uh, i mean uh, if that isn't uh, tyranny what is mm. and anyway uh, and then fourth but and less common than the others because it's a quadrant the fourth quadrant is what we call a seller tyranny uh, you might remember the cases where you know uh, the telephone lineman from uh, the local telephone landline telephone guy uh, used to be treated like a king by people, yeah. uh, especially in the 70s and yeah, yeah. perhaps even in the 90s uh, because they were the monopoly and uh, you know you uh, really i mean the, the high handedness with uh, the uh, high handedness with which they would uh, uh, behave is quite high even now the the, the guys who supply gas even to the yeah. last Uh, five years back when it was uh, deregulated uh, the the person who was delivering the gas uh, would demand an exorbitant amount of money yeah uh, and, and so th- that's that's a seller tyranny um so these are the four uh, tyranny uh, these are the four quadrants uh, and that's what the book explains and then the book explains what do you do if, uh, how do you figure out which tyranny, which uh, quadrant you are in and how do you make the move to a better quadrant uh, and you know uh, how do you sell into those quadrants how do you handle problems uh, between in relationships in those quadrants so those are the and i have given a lot of examples and uh, also based it on some amount of uh, uh, research into anthropology uh, in terms of human uh, relationships and that's how the book got put together uh, the, the whole idea of, of the book was i wanted to explain to myself why some customers behave the way they did and why sellers behave the way they did no fair enough i think and, very very well said and, and so it, this book was primarily written as a, a book for me <laughs> yeah and, and i think all all uh, i've spoken to quite a few authors and many say that this book was more a reinforcement and clarification for myself and if it helps somebody else you know more than more than delighted right and i think with the way you explained the four quadrants um, i'm sure will engage some of our um, listeners to 
go read the book um, i certainly see and this is where i connected with this team and with my team of managing better because we don't decide where we land in which quarter we land right? which quadrant we land but we always certainly can choose where do we go next and that is managing better that you know you land somewhere and then you make your life better uh, quadrant by quadrant is what um, uh, is in our control so i think uh, one uh, one final thing um, any message for our listeners from uh, from a consumer behavior point of view or something yeah uh, no I, you know as an author uh, my only my final message to viewers is read read as many books as you can and, and that's what is going to uh, you know you know enrich your life uh, I, i don't i don't say read my book that will be a shameless plug i don't want to do that uh, but read books uh, read the great authors you know any language uh, and and that gives you a better insight into life itself and it gives more tools they say you know uh, if you have a hammer every problem looks like a nail yeah so uh, books are about uh, books are about giving you more tools to handle what life throws at you and uh, and that's why i say that's that's totally fair. that totally yeah, fair i think wonderful about. message uh, ramesh because um, i also keep saying that books bring a sense of balance and give a toolkit so you know if if you it, it helps you understand Uh, what you're doing life in general everything in a certain balanced way and which is very much required in the, in these times more than ever because we are bombarded constantly from stuff which is uh, extremely negative at times and very difficult to consume if we start responding to everything uh, it's is extremely difficult to manage your day so thanks ramesh uh, with that i'll bring this conversation to an end um, sadly so uh, maybe uh, we'll do a longer session at some point but uh, thank you very much and uh, to our listeners um, and and people who will watch this session on youtube uh, i hope you enjoyed this uh, this series will continue we will bring you more speakers uh, in the next few episodes so keep watching till then manage better thank you